Lord of all creation. Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. Normally at this point, I let Jim welcome everybody, but Jim's not here this morning. Jim is not feeling well. I got a call yesterday, and uh, he's uh, could use your prayers, especially if you'd rather have him leading. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Um, do pray for Jim. Um, he needs to feel better. Um, and uh, so you can be in prayer for him about that. But we're here this morning. Did everybody have a good week? Amen. You had a good week? Then what are you doing here? This is for people who had a horrible week. This is a service for people who had a rotten week and they're hoping things will be better. Now, if you had a great week, you're very welcome to be here too. Um, and maybe actually you want to reach out to somebody else. If they look like maybe they didn't have such a good week, don't ask. All right? Don't ask, don't tell. But um, do enjoy one another and build each other up and uh, let people know that you care about them. 
uh, that'll that'll do good for us. We're going to begin in prayer in just a minute, but I realized I put the wrong song up here. So. Sorry, last minute scrambling. Ah, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for those of us who had a great week, who really just came through it just flying, just swimmingly. Father, we, we rejoice in that. We celebrate that you give us good weeks. And for those of us whose weeks just really were an endurance run and they've had a hard time getting through it, Lord, we're glad that we're here on a Sunday. Looking forward to better things to come. We know that there are things that are different for different people at different times, and we reach out our hearts, Lord, to build up one another and to see one another encouraged in the faith. As we walk together, whether hard times or joyous times come, Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful through it all. And we want to celebrate that this morning. Thank you. speaker is going to be sharing from the book of Galatians and uh, there's a song that we have from Galatians 2.20 you'll probably be able to pick up a little of the style of uh, somebody like Amy Grant it was written about the time that Amy Grant was kind of popular and I think a lot of songs that were written got, got uh, her stamp on it whether she wrote the song or not I have been crucified 
with my Lord and now I live because he lives in me the life I live I have been crucified with Christ And He is the one Who gave Himself for me In love He died That I might ever I work not for the faith to live I have been led to rest in God He is the one And He is the one Who gave Himself for me In love he died That I might ever live With work to do I work not for the faith to live I have been led I have been crucified with my Lord, and now I live because He lives in me. The life I live in flesh I I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. that song was written uh, Nancy Higginbaum also known as Nancy Honeytree which is how the word how the name translates into English um, wrote the song I've got to figure this out folks. like a little child Jesus told me to come, and the Father lifts me up, up to heaven, up to home, Father lift me up, hallelujah, holy is your name, Father lift me up. the earth. 
righteous self. Jesus told me I will live. Crucified with Jesus, I want to be. Jesus, lift me up. for each other. We're in a place and at a time when it seems like that everything that is established gets broken and everything that is broken can be repaired and made new. We celebrate, Father. We celebrate You're the God who makes broken things new. That you make the dead live again. That you bring new life as we bow before you. We're in a messy place, Lord. Some of it because of our own doing. Most of it because of our own doing. But some of it is way beyond us. And we cry to you from the depths of the earth. We cry to you because we long for you to make new the things that are broken. Things are broken. Things are carried here. I bow in prayer. It is grace, only grace, that brings us here, holds us together.
brings us here, holds us all together here, all together here. Things are dying here. Things are torn. Just our policy in terms of, um, uh, you know, COVID's out there. We all realize that, and and each uh, you know church has their own guidelines as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. But uh, it is getting, uh, as you know, there's there is a quite a, a situation in Williams Lake where uh, COVID is happening for sure. We want to keep each other safe, and so I'll just let you know what's happening. We do sanitize the entire building Sunday morning before you come. Uh, we do have sign up uh, list. You may have noticed that uh, again this morning to sign, to trace, and if there is a situation where someone has had COVID, they tell us, oh, I had COVID and I was at church, uh, just to be able to track and let you know. Uh, so that would be appreciated if you if you just left your information there just so you, for your own safety. And uh, the masks, we're recommending masks, but not, it's not mandatory. Um, again, uh, that's, that's our uh, current position, we're recommending people wear masks, but it's not mandatory. So it's up, final decision is up to you on that one. Uh, okay, and now just also before we go to the break, I want to uh, met usually at the time of the year we talk about our life groups, uh, the different groups that meet during the week and what have you. And um, I'm wondering, uh, basically, uh, with again with COVID, there's certain implications of that, certain 
Uh, you know, sometimes we can't meet in the home. If we meet in the home, there's only going to be five people. That's the current rule. You can only have five people in and what have you. But anyway, I'd like to uh, explain what is happening in terms of what's available, open to the church uh, right now, anyhow. And uh, Randy, did you want to mention uh, your group, the group that you're sort of a contact person for, for Sunday night? Sure. On Sunday night, uh, we have a gathering mostly online. There's a lot of people who want to stay at home on Sunday evenings, and uh, so we get together online. And uh, if you are interested, uh, you can call Ted, and he'll give you this uh, email, or I can just give it to you. Yeah, I think it's also in the directory. Radney at gmail.com is my email, and if you email me, I will send you the link. Uh, we're using, it's not a Zoom tool, but it's like Zoom. Uh, it allows us to see and hear each other. Uh, from various uh, homes and that sort of thing. And so that's probably where we're going to be tonight. Uh, we do sometimes have a gathering here at 35 Oliver on Sunday evenings. Um, I've talked to a few people, and I haven't heard anybody yet who's planning to be here. But if you are, please give us a call, Ed or me, uh, um, at home this afternoon. We'll be happy to meet you down here. Uh, we can run the sort of hybrid where we have some people here and some people at home. It seems to work well. For us, and we have the equipment to do that. So uh, just let us know if you'd like to meet at 35 Oliver. We're, we're fine with that. If you'd like to meet, meet at home, email me, and I will send you the link. Um, you have uh, internet access from where you are. Okay? Good. That's 6:30 tonight, right? That's uh, six o'clock. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Of course. That may be know. why you show up some Sundays. Why am I late sometimes? No, just, just kidding, no, Ted. Just, it's just usually on time, but for some reason. And people want to try to squeeze an extra 30 minutes in before we meet. But we do meet at 6, from 6 to 7.30, and we're, uh, we've are we been very good about, uh, there's some people who keep me on time. Other uh, than that, I'd probably go till 11. Um, but uh, there's people that keep me very much on time with that, 6 to 7.30. Going Sunday to the Gospels, nights. right? Yeah. And oh, yes, and I can, I can tell you, if you're planning to come, Mark chapter 12, we're beginning in verse 35. Jesus gets to ask his first question. There's been a lot of people in Mark 12 coming to him with questions. What's the greatest commandment? What do you do about people who are married before they, like when they're resurrected, wives and husbands and all that. They get to ask all their questions. And then Jesus has one sort of final question that he asks them. And so we're going to pick up with that discussion. Verse 35, chapter 12 tonight at 6 o'clock. And Leo, Wednesday night. Do you want to say a couple of words sure. about that, uh, what time and what we're doing and stuff like that? Uh, hi, I'm Leo Michelle. I, I uh, facilitate the Wednesday night study. We start at 7 o'clock. Ted has been really instrumental in making the Zoom available for us, too. So uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, sharing that time with us uh, and you don't want to come in person, we, uh, we meet here at 7 approximately. And, uh, and we're going through the Gospel of John right now. I believe we're on Chapter 19 coming up week uh, there's a few verses that uh, represent or that I, in my mind represent what our group is about one of them is uh, Acts 3.19 it says repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out that times and refreshing may come from the Lord and I think what, rep what our group represents our small group anyway is, uh, is that it's a time of refreshing right? and, uh, and we always want to give the Lord uh, the honor first in, in what's happening in our life and, and that starts to happen when we confess our sins him so and the other one is uh, John 7 38 and 37 38 says uh, he that believeth in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water that's what we we challenge ourselves with on a weekly basis that we want uh, not to trickle or we don't want to dam up those, those rivers that God gives us because it's a gift from the Holy Spirit uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse uh, 4 I believe it is uh, tells us that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts according to his will not ours so uh, it doesn't say not ours, but it, I, I threw that in there because that's how I look at it. So, um, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water if you believe in Jesus Christ. So, amen. Amen. Janina, did you want to come up just briefly? You got to just tell us about uh, bright lights. That's a meeting for the girls. That uh, well, you can tell them the details. How's that? Good morning. So. Uh, yeah, I'm really, really excited that this year we can meet again as Bright Lights. Uh, that is a small group for girls, um, grade 6 to 9, um, a discipleship program, and also we do some activities, as you can see on the back here. 
they did that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so last year was a little bit of a difficult year for the teens because we didn't really have church. And um, I have three teenage daughters, and they don't really like to sit in front of the phone or computer and listen to preaching Sunday morning. So um, it's always nicer for them if they can meet. And we are meeting Monday nights um, from 6 to 8 right here at the church. So I'm really happy that um, this year we are allowed to do that and that I am physically well enough to do it as well again. So yeah, if you know anybody that's interested, um, invite them. Um, it is a discipleship program. Basically, we are studying um, Esther this year. Um, girls wanted to study a book of the Bible and not just random stuff. And so that's what we came up with. We do not go by ages, we go by grades, six to nine, yeah, because ages, it makes it really difficult because then quite often, um, you know, somebody in grade six and was born in January, the other person is born in November, but they're all in grade six, so then one has to wait very long until they come that age, so we go by grades, it kind of seems to make it easier. Yeah. Thank you, Janina. Thanks very much for doing that. And also, uh, Terry or Lisa, are you here? Uh, oh, Lisa. Just uh, we have a youth group that they're uh, coordinating also, which is very cool. So she's going to say a few words about that at this time. I hope. <laughs> so yeah, we're starting up a little bit late, um, but our so our first event is going to be on October eighth, which isn't next Friday, but the Friday after, and it's open for guys and girls age ten and up although okay so the first event will be 10 and up <laughs> but then the next friday um we're doing starting a video series that's four four episodes long and it's kind of geared for older kids so that so for then the next four weeks it'll be 13 and up and then we'll revert back to the the 10 and up after so if you have any questions about the youth group at all it's on friday nights um just come and talk to me after or next Sunday, or whenever you see me, or call me. <laughs> We're in the book under Bueller, B-U-H-L-E-R. Thank you, Lisa. And finally, uh, I'm hoping to start up a group at our house on Monday nights, not this Monday, but uh, next, uh, starting up the next couple of Mondays sometime. Uh, and uh, again, we're allowed up to five people to come when you're in a house or whatever. Uh, so um, we're maybe hoping to go through this book here, Stop Trying to Fix Yourself. I find it quite, I've done that book before with a couple other groups in the past. It worked out quite well. But uh, if you're interested in doing that kind of group with, with us and uh, at our house, just let me know. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen for sure. Again, that won't be this Monday, but maybe the Monday after. I'm not sure. We'll see how it comes together. Are you ready? Remember, we're going to start this. Uh, oh, funny. We start this on the bridge. Uh, your goodness is running after me. All right. Remember Psalm 23? Goodness and mercy. If you move fast enough, then goodness is running after you. So, And most of us move way too fast in this life. Your goodness is running now. Running after me, your goodness is running down, it's running after me. My life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running down, it's running after me. Love you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. All my life you have been faithful. Sing it out. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of oh, the 
You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other And I've known you as a father team excellent job and uh, leading us into worship always presents the uh, atmosphere where the holy spirit can come and minister to us so we really appreciate that uh just wanted to i know some of you probably already realize but just uh, maybe some of you don't i don't know but uh last week we prayed for uh claris's uh dad in alberta he was very ill and he did pass away i believe that evening sunday night uh, so uh, please pray for claris and pastor paul and their family i think uh, i think Claris is already still in Alberta there, but uh, the um, just pray for them if you would. Um, let's pray before we hit uh, do the message. Lord God, again we thank you that you are a God that runs after us. That uh, you know we run away, but you run after us, <clears throat> and we're just praying that we don't not run outrun you, Lord. And uh, so uh, just even pray that you would run after uh, every one of us in this worship service this morning. May the Holy Spirit move in our hearts and draw us to yourself. Uh, Lord God, you are good, and you're trying to make us good with the Holy Spirit and the, through the love and, and sacrifice of Jesus, and we're so thankful for that. And uh, we praise you for that, Lord. Just be with uh, Clara and Pastor Paul and the family right now. As they grieve the passing of Clara's dad. He was um, a man of God, and we're so thankful that we have an eternity with you. Um, and be with the message now as we as we proclaim it from uh, the book of Galatians. And uh, Lord God, you can. Uh, we just thank you. The Holy Spirit is here to take each each thing that's said, um, even if it's said imperfectly, to take it and uh, apply it to each heart individually where we're at. We thank you. We're thankful that you're a God of relationship, intimate relationship, that can speak to us on that level each one of us individually. We thank you and praise you for that. May it happen now for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I'm going to start a message uh, series on Galatians, um, and this will be chapter one. 
And the sermon uh, message is called The Grace Message Directly from God. And uh, we're going to just read uh, the first seven verses of Galatians 1. And um, it's, um, I'll do that for you if I could. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace, peace, be you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who calls you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I think that uh, Paul is, in my opinion, anyhow, the most remarkable writer in the Bible. I mean, the Bible's made up of, uh, you know, inspired by, every, by God, of course, but by authors from way back in the Old Testament to the New Testament and, and lots of different authors. But uh, the main one is Paul. He wrote, um, he wrote 13, half of the New Testament books, 13 of 27 books in the New Testament. And I think without doubt, I don't think too many people would argue with this, but he has the deepest understanding of the gospel message, uh, the, the good news message that we have as Christians, a message that's designed to show us how Jesus sets us free. Paul said in Romans, the, the gospel is the power of God to deliver and salvation, to free us. And that's, we all need freeing. We're kind of bound up inside. And uh, we need to be free. And that's what the gospel does. And Galatians, six chapters long, culminates, you know, gets, gets close to the end in Galatians 5, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness. That's, that's the kind of... Uh, uh, characteristics and quality of life that the Holy Spirit in us the fruit producing fruit through us is trying to do and who wouldn't want to be like that all the time right love joy peace. that's true holiness inner holiness by the Holy Spirit anyhow I see um, you know uh, the gospel sometimes it's, it's difficult to understand totally and how to apply it on a day to day basis and how, how the grace of God affects us. And we, I think the goal of, uh, for every one of us is when we, when we look at the, at the Bible is to try to determine, you know, what's the heart of the gospel? What's the bullseye? And I think the closer we get to understanding the purity of the gospel message, in my opinion, the closer we get to the bullseye of the gospel message, the more power we will experience. And, uh, you know, let's pray that that can perhaps happen to uh, today. Uh, we'll see if, if God speaks to us a little bit. So Galatians 1, uh, uh, Galatians 1, I've, I've, again, the message is entitled, A Grace Message Directly from God. So there's two main themes there, really. First of all, it's a grace message in, in Galatians 1. And secondly, it's a directly from God theme also. So grace message directly from God. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at. That's the outline of the of the message today. So let's take a little closer look at that. First of all, uh, the great message theme uh, begins, uh, the, he begins in verse 3, uh, in terms of talking to us, in terms of teaching. The first word he uses is what? Grace. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. And then, uh, and then he uses the word grace again in, in, uh, in uh, chapter, in verse 6. He says, grace defines what the true gospel message is. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. That's, that's one way to define Christianity. It is living in the grace of Christ. And he says, you're turning to a different gospel. So that's how important this concept of grace is. And then uh, in, in verse 15, he says this. Uh, he's talking about personal experience when um, when God called me he says in verse 15 God called me or drew me to himself by his grace 
Uh, you know, uh, we're drawn to people not when they're mean or demanding or, and, or, or critical. We're not drawn to people like that. At least I'm not. But I'm drawn to people when they're very gracious. Maybe when I'm locked up and yet they come with compassion. That's okay. Let's, let's do it this way. I'm drawn to a person like that. Are you? That's, and they got, he's, Paul says, he drew me by his grace. And then uh, he's talking about when, he, when God called him to be a Christian. Do you remember the story, of course, the Apostle Paul was, uh, before he was an apostle, of course, he was a Pharisee in the Jewish religion, and he hated Christianity. He despised Christians. He killed them even, persecuted them, killed them. He was a murderer. He was the number one, the number one enemy of the kingdom of God against Jesus. The number one enemy of Jesus. So then, on the road to Damascus, he was going there to arrest some Christians or whatever, all of a sudden, boom, this big light happens. And it's Jesus. He says, uh, and, 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 the, and Jesus says, uh, why, why are you persecuting me? Isn't that wonderful? I love that. Because, you see, we're a part of the body of Christ. Jesus' life is in us. Jesus' life is through us. And Jesus says, when you hurt one of my parts of my body, like my hand and foot, you're hurting me. Why are, you, why are you persecuting me, Paul? Saul. His first name was Saul. He's turning to Paul later. And, uh, and, he, and Paul says, Who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. And he's freaking out. He's like, What have I done? What's going on here? Like, I thought Jesus was like a big phony, right? An enemy of, of the will of God. And here's Jesus talking to me, as, 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 as appearing as God himself. And, he's, and Paul's probably thinking, Okay, I had it. I'm toast, right? I've been trying to kill your people. I'm toast. Instead, Jesus says, I tell you what, I'm going to make you a wonderful servant to all the world, the Gentiles. You go to such a place and I'll tell you what to do. Can you imagine that? That's grace. Right? He deserved this. And he got this. He was the number one enemy and became the number one servant overnight. Is that grace or what? I call that grace. That's the kind of God that Paul knew. So anyhow, that's uh, the grace theme. And then uh, we need to look at the directly from God theme, um, number two. Again, again, we'll look at a few verses here that talk about that. Paul got this grace message directly from God and was sent by God to tell us. He wrote the, wrote the book of Galatians. He tells us what, what God told him. First of all, he says in verse 1, he was sent by Jesus Christ, not man. Here it is, Paul, an apostle, sent not from man, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. No person, no human being, said, you know, Paul, you need to go out and start preaching the gospel. No, I, did, I was not sent by anybody except by a, 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 a direct <laughs> command, commission, Jesus Christ. Amazing. And then we find this concept of, of uh, directly from God, uh, again in verses 11 to 12 of chapter 1. Uh, again, he's saying it's not from human origin. It's a, it was a personal revelation from Jesus. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. It was Jesus, one and one with Paul, who said, now look, I want to give you the, the fine details of the gospel. It's a very powerful message, Paul, and uh, I need to reveal some more stuff. And I've chosen you to reveal the fine, t- t- the fine points and the power of the gospel like nobody else has, has really known. They, they knew the gospel, but not the way I'm going to show it to you. He couldn't get it from any man because no one had it. It's new stuff, in a sense. It, it's advanced stuff. It's taking the basics of the gospel and, 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 and blowing it up into things we can't even imagine beyond the grace beyond what we imagined he says Jesus Christ personally taught that to me wow that's amazing and then uh, and then he says in the next uh, verses one, uh, 15 to 17 he says this but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb called me by his grace my immediate response was not to consult with any human being I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. 
But I went to Arabia. What are you doing? You know, like here you are, he's brand new Christians. The first question you ask, I know who the leaders are, the ring leaders. It's the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, you know, like, like Peter and John and James. And, you know, I better go see them. Like, wow, well, I don't know. They know all about Jesus. I don't know anything about Jesus. Did he go there to see them? No. <laughs> he went to Arabia, of all places. What's in Arabia? A bunch of sand? I don't know. But he was taught. And then he goes on to say in verses uh, 18 to 20, he says, after three years, <laughs> after he's been in Arabia for three years or whatever, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him for 15 days. I guess he said, well, finally, better talk to these guys. They're the leaders of the Christian movement up here. And I saw no other dis- apostles. I didn't see any of those other guys except James, the Lord's brother. He said, I assure you before God, what I'm writing to you is no lie. No lie. Can you imagine people saying, you got this message directly as a, from a revelation of Jesus Christ. You didn't know beans all about the Christian message. You talked to no Christian leaders, no Christians whatsoever. You went to Arabia, and you got this stuff downloaded. Like, we, you know more than we do now because you got it directly from Jesus. Are you telling us that? What would he say? Yep. No lie. No lie. Pretty amazing, eh? So, there is a grace message. This is a grace message directly from God, hot off the press. This is the heartbeat of the gospel message uh, directly from God to Paul for us. So for the next few weeks, let's take a look at this remarkable message of grace. It is the clearest expression of how the gospel of God transforms lives through Jesus Christ. So, Let's first talk about grace. Paul starts his message in verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to say something. At the beginning of all Paul's 13 letters, if you read through, you can, you can go home and read this if you want to. It's like homework assignment. <laughs> At the beginning, within the, verse three or four, within the verse three, first three or four verses, of each book that he wrote, each letter that he wrote, he says the same thing, exact same thing. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his constant theme. It's almost as if he's saying, hey, let's get something straight right here at the beginning. You know, I'm writing this letter to you. Let's get something straight at the beginning. God is constantly pouring out on you his grace and his peace. You need to know that. This is the foundation of the message Jesus personally gave directly to me. Everyone. That's how it started. So what is grace? Uh, next slide there. What is grace? And to me, um, my, th- my, th- my favorite three examples of grace from the Gospels, I could go anywhere, I guess, but to the Gospels, my favorite three uh, pictures of, the, of grace are the prodigal son, the praying Pharisee and tax collector, and Jesus washing dirty feet. I love them. First of all, let's look at the prodigal son. The next, uh, the next slide there. You all, probably most of you realize the story. If you don't know it, I, I apologize. But it was a situation where a uh, father had two sons. His youngest son uh, got really uh, rebellious and said, I want my inheritance now, and I'm out of here. I, I, I've had enough of you guys, and I want my inheritance. So he, he took half his father's inheritance, ran off and went and spent it on mine, woman, and, and song, and what have you, and uh, until eventually he got broke, and uh, then he was... Uh, in a situation where he had to feed pigs in order to survive, and he was even starving to death then, and he said to himself, you know what, this is crazy, at least I can go back home, I've disgraced my family, but maybe, 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 they'll at least give me a job as one of the servants, at least I won't starve to death, right? So on he goes, he sort of rehearses kind of a, a repentance speech kind of thing, he's walking, and just as he's coming up the long driveway, his father sees him coming, because his father had been looking for him every day, because the father loved his son. I don't care how rebellious it is. I love my son. And here he's coming up towards the drive. And it says the father, you know, uh, it says he, he wrapped his skirts around his, his, his legs because he had wore skirts in those days. Kind of cool, I guess. And anyway, he started running to, to beat the band. Running, racing towards him. And 
He, you know, the son just started to rehearse his speech. Oh, boy, here comes my dad. He's going to chew me out probably. But no, he, didn't, he got about two or th- one sentence in, and then boom, his father falls on him, braces him, kisses him, kisses him, kisses him, and he's just, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And then what did he do? He says, hey, let's have a party. Let's celebrate. My son was dead. Now he's alive again. And he restored him to everything in every, every, every way. And the guy didn't even have a chance to, to, to finish his repentance sentence. I call that grace. And then I like the, the story of the, the, the praying Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, there's a picture of the Pharisee who was praying to God. And uh, remember that story, I think it's in Luke. And... Uh, He's saying, uh, oh, I thank you, God, that I am so righteous. I, uh, you know, I do this, I do that. I keep all the laws, and I go overboard, and, and, and uh, do more than I have to, and whatever. You must be really pleased with me. <laughs> and uh, then there was a tax collector who was despised. Tax collector was despised in that society. Was behind him. And he knew he had nothing to commend himself to God whatsoever. It's zero, 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 zero. He, was a, he knew he was a sinner, and all he could do, all he could do, was pray to God, say, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've got nothing, nothing I can give you." And then Jesus says, "You know what? The person that went home righteous before God and justified and declared righteous before God, God says, "Yes, you are righteous before me. You are perfect." It was not the Pharisee; it was that tax collector. Because you know, in and of ourselves, there's we can't be righteous. There's none that does good. Sometimes we think we are, maybe, I don't know, but any righteousness we have is a gift from God. Jesus for us, Jesus in us, Jesus through us. But that's grace. And then I like the, sec- uh, the third story here, when Jesus washes, quietly washes the disciples' dirty feet, and this is in John 13, I think it is, and um, here are the disciples. This is the, the, the night before Jesus was crucified. They just had the Last Supper. Again, the disciples were arguing for the 564th time, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if that irritated Jesus or not, but it would irritate us. You know, we've been spent three and a half years to pour our lives into these guys. I'm going to die on the cross for your sins tomorrow. I'm going to turn the church over to you guys, and you're still arguing who's the greatest in the kingdom. That'd be a little irritating to me. I don't know. And, of course, there was nobody to wash their feet, so they all had dirty feet. And none of them had any, enough humility to, to, uh, to, to uh, take a, you know, a, a basin of water and, and, and wash the feet of the other disciples. No one had that humility. Not gonna do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna it. It's beneath me. It's beneath me. So Jesus just quietly does it. He washes the dirty feet and did not complain. And Peter said, you can't do that. That's beneath, uh, you, you can't do that. Who do you think you are? You're, you're, you're God. You can't be bending down on your knees before me and washing my stinky, dirty feet. You can't do that. And Jesus said, if you don't let me show this kind of grace to you, then you can have no fellowship with me. You want to have fellowship with God, it's like he's, we've got to let him, let him. He's coming. We're not asking, will you please wash my dirty feet? He's doing it anyhow. We've got to let him. I don't know if that melts your heart or not, but it's also a fantastic picture of grace as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes God does stuff for us. Many, t- always does stuff for us when we deserve it. It reminds me, remind me of a story. I hope I've got time here to say just for you. When I was, um, I guess it was the late 1970s. I guess I was in my early 20s or mid-20s or something. I can't remember now. And uh, I was, uh, I was, um, Living in Vancouver Island, but I was I was at home in, in Langley, and I was sort of um, taking uh, my mother and a couple of nieces uh, up to Prince George. So on the way up to Prince George, just before Boston Bar, uh, our, my car went. <laughs> it, it kind of um, the engine overheated, and it was ready to you know it just said hot, it's going to explode. I was like, oh my goodness! So I coasted into. Uh, thankfully, there was like a uh, sort of a, a, a local store there. It looked like a little grocery store in the middle of nowhere. And I, and I coasted in there. And in those days, I was not, uh, I need to say this, in those days, I was not exactly, I was a Christian, but I was not really walking with the Lord. Like, I've had a lot of disappointments. Ever, has God ever disappointed you? And he's disappoint, he disappointed me. And I was, things weren't going the way I wanted them to go, you know. Here I am serving you, Lord. And how come these things aren't happening? That's not happening. This is not happening. So I was kind of a, 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 a not, not, not on talking terms with God, really. I was kind of a snotty attitude. And uh, anyhow, uh, so I went into the, the store, and I said, uh, 
my, car, my, my you know, the car's boiling over there because there's something wrong with it or whatever. She says, oh, you'll probably have to get it towed to um, Boston Bar. And just because it, it hot, so, it's so hot and there's so many cars there, it probably take two or three days before they even get to it. Get to it. In the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and I said, oh, no. But she said, oh, wait a minute. There was like, they had, she had about four or five small cabins on the property. And she says, I think there's a, there's a guy here that's staying there that's, that's actually a mechanic. Do you want me to ask him if, if he can take a look at it? Yes, please, yes, please. So he came up. Imagine this. He came up, took a look at it, said, oh, yeah, I know what the problem is. If you, if you, um, if you can get a, this particular part, he gave me the name of it, up to me uh, today, I'll put it in for you. So I phoned my dad, who didn't come up for some reason. I said, this is the part we need. Can you get it? And Langley, he's it Langley. So he drove it up there. We put the part in, and we were ready to go again. And my mom, who was a very strong Christian, said, well, that sure was the Lord, wasn't it? And I didn't want to say, yes, isn't he wonderful? Because I wasn't talking, talking terms with him. Does God show us grace sometimes when we're snotty? He, he approaches. He pursues us. Would you agree? Do we deserve it? It wouldn't be grace if we deserved it. Grace to you. Grace to you. Wow. Well, that's the heartbeat of the gospel. I know that much for sure. So we cannot, uh, we cannot earn God's love by our performance. We can only receive God's love as we are. When we receive God's love as we are and not as we ought to be, we are receiving God's grace. Right? That's the very definition of what, of what, what grace is. So uh, now let's talk about peace. Grace and peace from God our Father. Those are the two words he used all the time, grace and peace. The opposite of peace is inner torment. Would you agree with that? Because of the rebellion of Adam and Eve, all of us uh, are born with empty hearts that are kind of unsettled, born that way, and dying bodies. Would you agree when you're born, you're still dying every day? It's because of sin, right? Adam and Eve. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Eve. Yeah. And we spend our lives trying to relieve our inner torment by various means. But only God can give us deep peace. Jesus said uh, in uh, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. That's just before he was crucified and ascended to heaven. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Now the world tries to give us peace, and we try to melt peace out of the world. He says, no, I give you a different kind of peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Before we get into how Jesus gives us peace, and we're going to look at that, how does the world try and give us peace? That's my question right now. Now, if I read the Bible correctly, the greatest need we have as human beings is is to feel accepted and loved and valued. We have this lingering sense of inferiority, failure, guilt, and shame. How did this happen? Well, God tells us shame entered our lives when Adam and Eve turned against him. The first thing that happened when they took that apple and ate, Adam ate the apple too, was they became self-conscious. They suddenly saw their nakedness, how naked they were. And if, you, you know, if, if we were naked all of a sudden here in this room, we'd, we'd feel a lot of shame. Would you agree with that? Isn't that a wonderful picture of shame? A fantastic picture of shame. I can't think of anything more, more uh, a better picture of shame than that. They feel shame. And they covered themselves up immediately with leaves in shame. Now this deep sense of inner guilt and shame causes our inner souls to be restless in torment. Now here's how the world tries to eliminate our, our inner torment or shame. And here's some of the ways uh, that we try to do it ourselves as we get it from the world. The only thing we do is get it from the world, I guess. Number one, we try to live in such a way to be accepted by people. We want others to accept us and tell us you're okay. It is amazing how much, you know, like when I'm with you and I'm treating you very nice and I'm being very pleasant, um, you know, hopefully some of it's genuine. <laughs> but honestly, let's be honest with each other. Some of it is like, I hope they like me. 
honest. Let's be honest. It's deep within us. I want people to like me. I want people to accept me. So I'll be nice to them. Then then they'll like me and accept me. And then a second way is uh, we deal with our shame is we try we protect our insecurity by being defensive when we are criticized. Now, when someone criticizes you, what's your first reaction? Oh, thank you for showing the point of that out to me. You're so wonderful. Boy, I'm happy you do that. Hey, is that your first reaction? Be honest. It ain't mine. Immediately, boom, I'm on the defensive. I'm on the defensive immediately. That's why sometimes we lash out in anger and frustration when we feel that we're not being valued or respected by other people. We are already feeling adequate to begin with, and then someone load, unloads us like, on something like that and criticizes us. Well, we don't need that rubbed in our face, so we just react. It's, it's true. I don't care if you're a Christian or not a Christian. The flesh is the flesh, and, and our faith is not perfect in this world, right? At least mine isn't. My faith won't be perfect until the next world. And so I still have, you come out to me and start criticizing me. That was a crummy sermon, Ted, you know. And, you know, my first reaction is, oh, well, I'm sorry. You know, but I'm thinking, well, ah. right? Okay, here's the third way. We are often critical of other people. You see, the more we can put other people down, even the government makes us feel good, the better we will feel about ourselves. Because we feel so low, so inferior, if someone's, we think someone's up here above me, if we can go and bring them down, that brings us up. And it makes us feel better about ourselves. We're so desperately in shame and have such a bad, low self-esteem. It, ha- it all happened from Adam and Eve. And yeah, that's what the gospel is about, trying to, you know, take care of that kind of problem. And then uh, sometimes we try to medicate our inner pain and shame with drugs and alcohol and careers and pleasures, etc. I think all of us do that to one extent or another. Some of the things we do bring a temporary relief, you know, but when they wear off, we are worse off. <laughs> And of course, we can become addicted and enslaved to almost anything to one degree or another. Would you agree with that? So, fear and shame are the foundation of our inner torment. But God is constantly trying to shower upon us not only His grace, but also His peace. He wants to take care of what's going on down here. But notice that the order of these two words, grace and peace, are very important. Grace comes first, peace comes second. Receiving God's grace, receiving God's grace, always results in inner peace. The more grace we are willing to humbly receive from God, the more peace from God we will experience. So God's solution to our inner sense of shame and torment is His peace, which comes from His grace. It is only in accepting God's deep, unconditional, and gracious love that our hearts are softened towards Him, towards ourselves, and towards others, and we begin to experience deep inner healing. Peace with God, I think that's the next one, peace with God results in peace within, which results in peace with others. That's the chain. But that chain of transformation can only start from the grace of God. It all starts with the grace of God. But the problem is that the problem is God cannot accept us just as we are in our sin. He wants to, but if he did that, that would be kind of unjust. It would like uh, be like a judge in a court case where there's a mass murder. Someone finally caught this guy. He's murdered you know, tons of people. And he's guilty as, as guilty as sin. And he, everybody knows it. And he's before the court. And the judge says, I'm going to pass judgment on you now. Here it is. Okay, we forgive you. You are free to go. Try not to do it again. Every one of us has a deep sense of justice within us. 
And we would say, that's wrong. There needs to be consequences. There needs to be justice. And God is the judge of the entire universe, and he is very just. He can't just let us go as if nothing happened. And deep down in our spirits, we all know that. Every human being knows that deep down in their spirits, whether they admit it or not. And so, he came up with a solution that would allow him to show grace to us in our sin and at the same time be just. How did he do that? Well, here's the plan. Here's the plan. He became a human being. God himself became a human being in the person of Jesus. And he took all our rebellious sins and all our hurts and all our pains, everything, upon himself and paid the penalty by dying on the cross in our place, in our place, so that we could be forgiven legally, justly, because he paid the price for us. So now he can show us grace and give us peace just the way we are. So that's why the only reason we can receive grace and peace from God is because Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us, to deliver us from this horrible inside torment that we have. And that's what Paul goes on to say in verses 3 and 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. God wants to rescue us right now. I know it doesn't get totally done until we die and go to heaven. I know that's, that's total salvation. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know about you. But in the meantime, he still wants to rescue us as much as he can to deliver us from fear, anxiety, anger, and emptiness in our hearts and the restless sense of uh, that's in our hearts. He wants to rescue us today from this present evil age. And then... Uh, and then Paul says, one evidence that we really believe, you know, if we really believe that God loves me just the way I am through, because of Jesus, and I just say, Lord, I can't believe it. You're so good. I can't. What a wonderful God that you just love me and, precious in, and I'm precious in your sight just the way I am in all my brokenness and all my sin. I can't believe that you're that kind of God. Oh, I love you. I praise you. Paul says, one evidence that we really believe that we have been freed from our sins by God and are dearly loved by him just the way we are uh, because of the sacrifice of Jesus is this. We will break out into spontaneous praise to God. And that's not what he does next in verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's, he couldn't help himself. As you read through the letters of Paul, you will see that he can't help himself. He is constantly breaking out into spontaneous praise to God for the grace and peace we have received through Jesus Christ. This is the only solution to the world's problems. We can muck around, but, but if the heart is, is alienated, if the heart is hurting, if we're all defensive, and, and, and well, what, what hope is there? We can medicate it. We can do this and that. Maybe improve it a little bit here and there. But the real solution is what? Jesus. The grace of God through Jesus. He's the only solution. So, two things happen when we receive and reflect. When we receive and reflect on the grace of God for us. And that's hard. It's hard, isn't it, to believe this stuff? I know it's hard. But that's our only solution. Two things happen when we receive and reflect on the grace of God for us because of the death of Jesus. Number one we do experience supernatural peace and healing within. And number two, we spontaneously break out in praise to God. And that is joy, right? So far, so already in describing the fruit of the Spirit, he's going to talk about that in Galatians 5. We've already got first the first two of the first three. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We're already there because of the grace of God. But sadly, but sadly, the next uh, slide there, we have a hard time believing the hardcore, <laughs> I call it the hardcore gospel. Hope you don't mind me saying that. The hardcore gospel good news message that God has directly given to us through Paul. Something deep within us still calls out and says, I need to earn God's love and approval. I need to earn other people to love and approval. I, it just can't be given to me as a gift. 
That's too good to be true. And so we tend to drift away. Even as Christians, we tend, churches, it's just all through history, the same thing. We tend to drift away from the hardcore gospel and start emphasizing things we need to do to get God's approval. And we start to twist the gospel a little bit so it starts becoming a different kind of gospel. At least that's what Paul says. Paul says, the next slide there, we stop living in the grace of Christ. And that's what Paul immediately warns us of in verses 6 and 7. He says, I'm astonished. He's just finished praising God for what he's done, right? I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. That's, that's a definition of how, what a Christian is. He lives or she lives in the grace of Christ. You're, he says, you're starting to desert the one who tells you to do this and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so, in the rest of Galatians, which we'll be getting into eventually, Paul tells us how easy it is to drift away from, the li from living in the grace of Christ and start manufacturing a different gospel, which includes, you know, includes Jesus and his death for us, uh, but it just kind of mixes in with a bunch of other stuff that we kind of need to do in order to earn our acceptance. And he's desperately appealing to us to come back to Christ and to Christ alone. He says, we live in the grace of Christ. There is no other way to live. Now, before uh, I uh, leave uh, this chapter one, uh, Paul introduces, introduces us to another way. He introduces us to another way we, we receive the grace of God. Not only has Jesus died for us so that God can pour out his grace and, and peace upon our, uh, in, our, in our sins and imperfections, hard to believe. Somehow also, somehow the resurrected Jesus himself comes into our heart, the heart and core of our beings. Our hearts have become the home where Jesus lives in us and lives through us. Here's what he says in Galatians 1, 15 to 16. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, there's that grace again, was pleased to reveal his son in me, not to me, but in me, the, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The literal Greek says, in me, not to me. So not only did Christ die for us, for our forgiveness, he also rose from the dead to come in us for our life. So we need, we need Christ's forgiveness. The next slide there, I think. We need Christ's forgiveness to eliminate our shame. But we also need his life so that we can be transformed. The gospel message Paul received directly from God is all about Jesus. He says that I might preach him. What a simple message, Jesus. <laughs> One word. It's all about Jesus. Not too complicated. Yeah, that's right. And that's why all he does is preach him among the Gentiles. And that's Galatians 1.16 there. So people, uh, just coming to the end here, hang on. People have argued constantly against Paul and said, uh, you know, his writings, and said it's very dangerous to, to live in grace and under grace, right? It's very dangerous as if we are totally already accepted and loved by God just the way we are. I mean, we might start taking advantage of it and start living like the devil. <laughs> and you know what? We could, I guess. Except for one thing you're forgetting. Jesus not only died for us, he now also lives in us. He's changed our hearts. We don't want to sin anymore, deep down. We have the power of his holy love in the depths of of our hearts. Now we're going to look at uh, uh, Galatians 2 next week, but let me close by just showing you where Paul talks about these two dimensions of Jesus for us and Jesus in us together in just one verse. And it's the famous verse we already sang about it, Galatians 2.20. We already sang about this. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Really? 
And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. I believe Jesus is in me. I believe Jesus is through me. I'm very imperfect, but as I walk out by faith, I believe somehow Jesus is going to show up and touch people's lives. It's all about him. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's talking about dying on the cross for our sins. That's two dimensions of God's grace, right? Christ in me, Christ for me. And then he simply says in verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. So here's my last statement. Last last slide here. Life is all about what Jesus has done for me and is doing in me. This is the grace message directly from God for us through Paul. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the grace message uh, from Galatians 1. I pray that Jesus has been lifted up and honored in a proper way today. I pray that you will receive all the glory and honor, Lord, in our lives as much as possible. May we grow, may we all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for all of us uh, today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. that you've uh, you've gone through facing mountains that some of you have even been come face to face with dealing with the power of the grave you've been in trials there's been change everybody loves change until it comes to the change part right we've been through it but one thing remains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change This one thing remains This one thing runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails your love never fails And I never ever have to be afraid This one thing remains This one thing remains Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. i
stood by the power of your great love. His death is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. Nothing that can separate my heart from your runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails. Your love never fails me. Your pour it out. You lavish it upon us through your grace. We have received and we walk in that grace. Not because we deserve it. Far from it. As we fail, as we fall, as we falter, as we struggle, as we hurt, as we hurt others, so your grace is poured out on our lives. Teach us, Lord, to live in that grace and to go forth from here as blessed people walking in your grace and the power of your great love. Amen. You're dismissed.